this you have done. This have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet you say, wherefore? Why? Because the Lord hath been witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy, com thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit. And wherefore? Why, why did he make one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. He's talking about divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. Turn tell your neighbor, the Lord is talking about the value of marriage. That's what he's talking about. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. It's a word for the day. It is crucial that we understand the significance of God from the beginning when he made Adam and Eve. It was the objective of God to reproduce in the earth. In Adam and Eve, Adam bore all of the seed of humanity. Every one of us matriculated from the seed of Adam. All of us were present in that garden in the seed of Adam. And God's intent, intent was, of course, to reproduce the earth with godly seed. People who were after God's own heart. People who conducted themselves with reverence and honor and worship of God so that God could bless them. And God had blessed Adam and Eve giving them the paradise of God. They were there in the amenities and the blessings of God were full, outpouring. They could just walk out and be blessed. Every need was being met until treachery came in. And the devil introduced the idea in the mind of Eve and to Adam and it caused them by receiving it to be separated from the blessings of the Lord. Now in self-will, they were stuck walking out of the garden having to till the ground for themselves. Tilling is what a farmer does to dig up his crop, which represents struggling in life. They were under the auspices and the blessing of God, but they wanted to do their own thing. They would not submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness, went about to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Because of it, life began to be a struggle. They were being fed by the hand of God, blessed of the hand of God. But they didn't understand the significance of God's purpose. And whenever we don't understand the purpose of a thing, chances are we're more likely to abuse it. God had blessed them. and They didn't realize the value of what God had given them. It brought them into unity with him and everything that God has. The Bible said that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything that we need, God's got it. Paul said, my God shall supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4 and 19. He records this. God wants to supply us, wants to make a way for us. But God cannot override our free will. He's given to every man free will. Deuteronomy 30 and 19 records him saying, I lay before you death and life, blessings and cursings. You choose. Then he hints and says, choose life so that you and your seed may live. And note that God unequivocally did not just say you, but he talked about your seed too. So God's not concerned about you. 
only. He's concerned about all that pertains to you. Amen. Your children, your grandchildren. Amen. He wants you to be blessed. But selfishness causes people to think about nobody but themselves. Amen. Pleasure for just a moment can cause people to forget about the whole family. Forget about everything else, the bills, the wife, the children, the cars, every, everything that God has blessed them with. Oftentimes they forget about it. But the Bible declared that the book of, uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 25 that Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt. The Bible said he had a respect under the recompense of the reward. He, he thanked God for what he had. Yeah. If what he had was only on the wilderness, God gave it to him and he knew that it was a blessing for him. And whenever God gives you anything, it comes forth in seed form. And that means God's planning to multiply. Touch your neighbor and say, God, getting ready to multiply us. Getting ready to multiply anybody who will hold on and trust God and hold fast to God's unchanging hand. The devil has a way of trying to give us something that may seem good at the moment, yet not be right. Because good's not always right, yet right's always good. And anything that God gives you, if it's just a little bit, it's good. Hold fast to it. God knows how to multiply it. They put anything and you put it in God's hand. Anything you put in God's hand, you can look for it to be multiplied. The young lad gave Jesus a man, two fish, and had five barley loaves. He multiplied and fed 5,000. God said, I'm getting ready to feed some folk today. Getting ready to open up some doors and some minds, some channels, some, ch some channels about to turn today. God wants you to understand the value of a marriage because a marriage should never be taken lightly. God values a marriage. Anything va God values, then we should value. You see, the word marriage actually means the covenant of God. Turn and tell your neighbor it's a covenant with God. It's nothing to be taken lightly. A covenant is a solemn and binding agreement. It's a promise under seal between two or more parties for the performance of some action. It's a binding contract before the Lord. It's a compact that's written in heaven. It's a compact in which individuals bound themselves to fulfill certain conditions and uh, are promised certain advantages. There's an advantage to being in covenant with God. Amen. Amen. Making a covenant of God was, solemn, was solemnly invoked. God was solemnly invoked as a witness. And an oath was sworn. I swear I'm going to do this, Lord. Yeah, folk come before the house of God. Come in the covenant of marriage in the church and they tell God, I swear, yes, sir, preach, I'm with you. Yes, sir, I'm in the vision. I'm in here. They swear they're going to be involved. They're going to be with the house of God. And oftentimes, they don't realize that a breach of covenant is a heinous crime. And the Lord said in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse number 5, that it's better not to pay, better not to vow and not pay, than you should vow. Uh, it's better not, uh, better, he said, it's better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. He said, don't allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin, neither say before the pastor, the angel of the house, that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your voice and then destroy the work of your hands? He said, for in the multitude of dreams, in many words, there are divers vanity. Folk just say anything God is saying. He said, but he wants you to fear God, keep his commandments, for that's the whole duty of man. But there are many who don't understand a significance of a marriage uh, to a wife, to a husband, a marriage to a church, but most of all, a marriage to God. According to Proverbs 2 and 17, the marriage contract is called the covenant of God. And so marriage is valuable to God. You wonder why? Well, because, let leads me to my first point, turn to your neighbor, marriage is a covenant with God. To sow seed. That's why God wants a marriage because in the earth and realm, people are doing any 
thing and everything. Men are marrying men. Women want to do what's nasty and marry women. Amen. That's Paul talked about in the book of Romans. Talked about in Romans. Amen. Romans chapter 1. He said that they went about doing whatever they wanted to. They didn't honor or reverence God. They being ignorant of God. Did their own thing. But Paul said that they changed the truth of God into a lie. Worship served the creature more than the creator. They served the devil more than God. God is blessed forever. Verse 26, that chapter said, For this cause God gave them up unto their vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use of the body into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of a woman, they burned in lust one towards another. Men with men working that which is unseemingly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over, the Bible says, unto a reprobate man, man that cannot be saved. Man that won't hear the truth. Man that's blinded from the ways of God. To do things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boastfuls. Boasters, in, inventors of evil things, pornography, pornographic material, amen. Disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, saying they're going to do something and won't do it, lying before God without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, not caring for one another, hoping one another die early so they can get the money. Evil thinking, sitting out in the house of God finding fault against folk, mad because they want their way, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in doing those kind of things. God saying, I'm cutting them off. They can be around you, but they're the tares. I'm going to let them go up with the wheat, but there will come a time when I will bring forth and I will bring forth the wheat from the tares. And I will take the tares and I will burn them up, saith the Lord God. But the Lord has called us into covenant. Now the Bible declares in the book of Genesis chapter 8 verse number 22. It records while the earth remains, seed time and harvest. And cold and heat, summer and winter. Day and night shall not cease, the Lord says. This is the interwoven nature or method of operations set in the earthen realm by God himself. It's the way God wants things to be done. You see, seed is the principle for, re for producing and reproducing. God wants godless seed. He doesn't want ungodly seed. Cuts off ungodly seed. He wants godless seed. There are various types of seed. And as it relates to seed, the word is not limited to the physical. You've got to understand because, you see, seed is the prolific principle of all future life. In Scripture, seed is taken for the posterity of man, of beast, of trees, etc. All reproduction stems from a seed. The seed of Abraham, you understand, it denotes not only those who descended from him by natural issue but those who will imitate the character of Abraham, independent of natural descent. Basically, God has given to all of us five types of seed. He's given us our conduct, how to conduct ourselves right, our faith, what to believe in, to believe in the Lord, and so shall you be established. Believe. He's given us money. Said he'd feed us through the hands of men, Luke 6, 38. Make sure we are provided for, that we have, when we work hard, the money that we need. He's given us our money as a seed, and whatever we sow will cause us to reproduce. 
He's given us children, given us sperm to reproduce children. And uh, he's given us our words. Amen. Our words are seed. Now, we know that our children are the product of our natural seed. But in lieu of the fact that Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life, it's in the power of the tongue. We've got to understand that words are absolutely a valuable seed. And so Jesus said in Luke 18.11, in reference to a parable that he had just finished spoken, he said that the seed is the word of God. He was sowing the word of God unto others. And he wanted them to understand parabolically that the word of God is seed. And in 1 Peter 1, 23 says we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Jesus said himself in John 6, 63, that my words, they are spirit and they are life. And so in 1 Corinthians 9, 11, we find that preaching the word of God is called sowing seed. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 9, sowing seed is used to symbolize scattering or dispersing people abroad. The Lord said in Zechariah 10 and 9 in reference to his people, he said, I will sow them among the people and they shall remember me in far countries. I'm going to send you to Paris. I'm going to send you to the Cayman Islands. I'm going to send you to Haiti. I'm sending you to Africa. I'm sending you to Australia. I'm going to send you to London. And I'm going to send you to Watts and to Compton. And I want you to be mixed abroad everywhere. I want them to know my way. Said, I'm going to remember them in far countries and they shall live with children and they will turn again. I want everybody around you to know me through you. I'm going to send you everywhere. Because there are people who need to know me and they, they will die in their sin without me. But I've given you to be propagators. I'm causing your tongue to be like the pen of a ready writer. I'm anointing you from on high. I'm giving you the word of God. I want it to be quick and powerful, sharp and a two-edged sword on your tongue. Don't hold back the word. I want you to run and tell it. Touch somebody and say, feel not their faces. For the Lord has called you forth. You see, the Lord had chosen himself a people. A bride, if you will, to represent his ways in the earth. And God's people are called the bride of Christ. They are married to the Lord. And God himself is married to a backslider. No matter where you run, you're in covenant with God. First Peter 2 and 9 says that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And when a marriage is formed of God, when marriage is formed, God sanctifies it to produce, he sanctifies it to produce and to reproduce godly seed. God wants to use each godly family uh, to witness of him and of his ways uh, to a dying world. He wants them to know him through you, that they through him might turn from their sinful ways, turn and be saved. When believers in God, the God of all creation, come together in the name of Jesus, a man and a woman, when they come together in marriage, it is for the purpose of being witnesses of God's love and for producing and reproducing his ways and his methods before all in the earth and realm, that they may receive by example the love and the blessings of Almighty God for doing so. And so God promises to supply their every need as he develops them in his way. He wants every household not to act like the world act, not to sit in front of television and pick up all of the worldly stuff and the hip hop and, and the ignorance and the violence, but he wants you to show holiness, wants you to be able to, through what you have learned, show holiness. And that's why it's important for people of God to enter into the house of God, to come in the Bible study and study to show themselves approved. Workmen that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of God so that the way is in you. Because you can't do what you don't know. You can only do what that you do know. And there are a lot of folks who say they're God's people, but they don't come to Bible study. They don't pick up the Bible. They don't have the word in them, but they got television in them. Yeah, they got radio in them. 
They got worldliness in them, and they get on the phone and talk all kinds of gossip and backbiting and fault finding, and they think evil, and they wonder, are these really the people of God? No, they're carnal Christians, and they get mad when you come into the house of God and start wanting to worship and praise God because they're used to doing things their way. They don't have God's way. But David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I sin not against him. And God was anointing his people so that they may spread abroad the way of God. And their example would turn others away from the world system and to God's love and salvation. Yes. Judah, the Bible says here in our text, was in covenant with the Lord. Yet Judah had dealt treacherously. Treachery, you've got to understand. Treachery is a violation of allegiance or violation of faith. Faith to a marriage, faith to a wife, faith to a husband, and faith to God. It's a violation. It means that now your mind is wandering. I told the congregation some while ago that if you go out and eat ice cream, you got somebody cooking you a good meal at home, you get full of ice cream, might taste good to you, but it's sure enough not good for you. When you get home, that meal is good for you. But if you got so much ice cream in you, you won't have a taste for the meal. Some folk come home and don't know how to love and how to treat the folk that God gave them at home. They got so much stuff they picked up on the outside that when they come in the house of God, now their mind is against God's way, against God's man, against God's teachers, against God's deacons and ushers, against the house of God because they picked up some ice cream somewhere. It was good to them, but it wasn't good for them. You need some substance in your heart and your mind. Amen. You need your heart to be cleaned out. Some of them need an enema. Some need to be regurgitated. Amen. They need to throw up some of that stuff. That's why deliverance is necessary. God has given deliverance so that he can cast that stuff out of you so you can be clean. He said, wash you. Make you clean. Make you whole. He's called us out of that darkness. And God said to be in the world but not of the world. But my Bible shows us, amen, that Judah had dealt treacherously. It's, a, it's, a, it's being unfaithful. Judah had dealt treacherously. An abomination was committed in Israel and, the Bible says, in Jerusalem. Judah had profaned the holiness of God, which God loved, and had married the daughter, the Bible says, of a strange God. Yeah, strange God. That means somebody that is not God or something that is not of God. And, and there are folk right now on my way to church with my family, looked out and saw a man on his knees on the grass. Amen. He was in the lawn mowers right behind him. He was cutting his lawn, worshiping his grass on Sunday. That's basically what he was doing because he was showing more honor and respect on the Lord's day for the grass than he did God. Anything that you put before the Lord has become your God. He was worshiping on Sunday the grass. The devil had him tricked, bound down on his knees, making sure that grass was taken care of when he should have been in God's house, making sure the one who had been helping him. See, some folk don't know where the help come from. Two or three people say, but I know where my help come from. Come on, give somebody a high five. Say, you got to remember that, where your help come from. He didn't remember. Amen. He was worshiping a strange God. And the Lord had commanded his people not to be yoked together with unbelievers. He said, uh, by doing so, your hearts would be turned after their gods. And uh, he had told them in Deuteronomy 17 and 17 not to multiply wives. One is enough. Tell your neighbor one is enough. Look at somebody say, one husband is all right. Amen. Whatever you got, if, if you just got a little short husband, put some heels on him and walk with him. Give God praise with that. Amen. Whatever, whatever you got, whatever kind of husband, whatever kind of wife you got, hold on to that one. God can fix them. Yes, yes, God can. God can fix them. God can change them. If you spend time finding fault in them, I want you to understand you're saying to God that I really don't want this. And God will move that up out of your hand. But I want you to know that if you appreciate whatever God gives you, he'll add more to it. Tell your, tell your neighbor, I got to thank God for what I got. Look at somebody and say, we got to thank God for what we got. You want a bigger church, you got to take care of the one that God gave you. Amen. You want a better car, you got to take care of the one God gave you. Whatever God puts in your care. Be grateful, he says. Amen. And despise not that they are small things. You got to understand, God wants to do things for you. The Bible declares in 1 Kings chapter 11, it records that Solomon 
Solomon began to multiply wives and get him strange gods. Yes, he did. He multiplied wives and married pagan women who worship other strange gods. And you start hanging around with the folks who playing with Buddha and Hare Krishna and, and, and Mohammed, they're going to end up having you involved with that same stuff. Because if you get in the mud, you're going to get muddy. Come on, talk to me in here. That's right. Birds of a feather, they flock together. That's what they do. And God wants us to flock together. He wants us to be united in, in one accord and one faith. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And all of us are baptized into the same spirit. We ought to be all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said the day of Pentecost that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because they was in one accord. If ever the church can get on one accord, God can do mighty works, mighty things will happen. Yes, they would. The Bible declared that when it happened the day of Pentecost, Peter, who was a man of fearful conduct, but the Bible said he got bold all of a sudden. Stood up on the on the stood up on the on the balcony and began to preach the gospel of the Lord. You'd be surprised who can preach that gospel. You can be surprised if somebody, some of these women can take their shoes off and get down with that gospel. I'm telling you, there's some folk who can preach that bloody gospel who you never knew could preach. If ever you would just get on one accord and everybody get full of the Holy Ghost and let the Lord begin to use you. Yeah, it's not your will, but it's God's will to be done. God wants to use you. God wants to use somebody, but he needs somebody to be married to him. Somebody to be focused on him. Somebody whose mind is set that the Lord is my help. The Lord is my exceeding great reward. It, for God I live and for God I die. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what he wants. He wants somebody that wants to glorify him. Somebody that wants to praise him. No matter what the world is doing, no matter what God's there trying, he wants you to know that I am the Lord and I change not. Therefore, you sons and daughters are not consumed. I'm God who sits high and I look low. Hallelujah. Come on and give him a praise in the house. Amen. Solomon did this thing. And the Bible said that God had cut off. He cut them off. All those that did this kind of conduct, God had promised that he would cut them off. Amen. And so he said he would cut off the man that does. He said he wouldn't receive their offering. They, they could come in the house of God and give offerings, but God said, I ain't going to give. I'm not receiving that. In other words, in the way of God, increase comes by sowing. The Bible said you reap what you sow. And it's a sad thing that God says that your stuff is no good. I can't put that in my ground. No, no, because you got sin on yours. You got evil on yours. Your conduct ain't right before me. So I'm not going to multiply error. God wants to multiply faith. He wants to multiply holiness. <coughs> he wants to multiply righteousness and God is saying I want you to get right church before you get left I want you to go to the highways and to the byways <clears throat> he said I want you to have everything you need I want to fill the house up with people that love me and care about me but you got to love me first so you can go out and get some folks who are of like faith, like faith people who care about God see when you care about the house of God that means you care about God. When you care about the people of God, that means you care about God. When you care about your husband and your children, that means you care about God. When you care about your wife and your family, that means you care about God. And God is saying, I place this in your care. It's mine, but I'm lending it to you, and I need you to take care of it. Tell your neighbor, I got to take care of it. Because there's value in any covenant that we have with God. God wants you to value what he gives you. Hallelujah. You ought to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For everything you've given me. And so the Bible said that God would not receive the offering. He would cut off the man that did error. He would not receive their offerings. In other words, they would have no increase. Because if God don't receive your offering in the house of God, that's how you get your increase. And if your offering not cause you to receive increase, that means something wrong somewhere. Tell your neighbor you got to get right before you get left. They were sold, the Bible said, but they would not reap. Amen. And they were wondering why they were coming up short. God was looking at his people. And so the scripture said because of what Solomon did, God had to cut them off. Judah, the Bible said in Zechariah 10, 6 and 8, it says Judah and Joseph, God's people, was to redeem and to save all 12 tribes of Israel. Judah represents the southern two tribes and Joseph the northern ten tribes. 
But the Bible shows us that they end up losing that because of the conducts of Solomon. The Bible shows that the first Kings chapter 11, verse number 11, that the Lord told Solomon that because he had done this, He'd worship other gods. He was unfaithful in the marriage covenant to the Lord. He was unfaithful to the covenant that he had through his father David. And the Bible said because of his unfaithfulness, running out there dealing with other gods. Instead of coming to his church, he was running to every church in town. Instead of going to your wife, you're going to every woman in town. Instead of going to your husband, you're going to every man in town. God said that's unfaithfulness. When you vow, vow into a house of God, into a woman or to a man of God, God expects you to honor that vow. Tell your neighbor, God said, honor your vows. But the Bible shows that the Lord told Solomon that because he had done this, he would rend the kingdom from him and give it to his servant. But he said, notwithstanding, he would not do it in his days for David's sake. But he would rend it out of the hand of Solomon, out of the hand of Solomon, out of his son Rehoboam, rather. And Rehoboam lost ten of the tribes to Jeroboam because of Solomon's unfaithfulness to the marriage with God. There are some children that should have been blessed, should have had everything net, but their parents didn't do what they were supposed to do. Now they inherited error because their parents, instead of being faithful to God and making sure that the whole family got blessed through them, they ignored God. They were selfish. They did their own thing. And I want you to understand the significance of the value of faithfulness. The Bible said because of David's faithfulness, his son Solomon benefited. His son Solomon benefited so much he became the richest man that has ever lived. Whatever you do now will now reflect on your children thereafter. Tell your neighbor, it ain't just about me. It's also about them that come after me. And in this church, we won't be here forever. But there's somebody coming that may do greater. Jesus said, the work that I do shall you do also and greater work. He wasn't just thinking about himself. He was thinking about his disciples. He was thinking about the ones that would come after him. He was thinking about the church way down the line. Yeah, we got to understand what we're thinking about. It's not just about me. And there are some folks who are selfish and all they're thinking about is themselves. They don't understand the value of a marriage. Because when you are in a marital covenant with the Lord, and you are in a marriage. God honors it because he's using it to reproduce. He said to be fruitful in what? And God is looking for multiplication. God wants to increase. Tell your neighbor, say, I want some increase too. And when God gives increase, it's not just about you. It's about also those that will come after you. He gives you a portion. But he wants everybody around to be blessed. Everybody around you ought to be blessed because your cup should be what? Run it over. Yeah, tell your neighbor I'm getting ready to have a cup that's running over. I want good things. I, I want the best things to happen in me and my family. And so what I do now will determine what's going to happen to my children later. Tell your neighbor don't be selfish. Because the people of God had become selfish. They had ignored the purposes of God and they were doing what was wrong. God called it treachery. That leads me to my, my second point. Turn and tell your neighbor divorce is treachery. It is not the will of God. There are folks who up and just decide they're going to separate themselves and do whatever they want. That meant they were always operating under their own will. Because anybody who's given their will to God has submitted. That means what Jesus said in the garden was relevant to God. And what did he say? He said, nevertheless. That means there are some things that are happening that I don't like. There are things that are going on that I don't understand. There are things that will happen that I don't am not able to do anything about. But nevertheless, not as I will. Jesus was saying, God's will be done. And we are wondering right now, when we see all of these divorces, all these folks running from church to church to church, whose will were they serving in the first place? Because when you come into a marriage and you come into a covenant, God called you to be steadfast, to be unshakable to be unmovable and always abounding in the faith so that the children in the next generation may do the same thing and we wonder why children come up in the next generation that don't even know God because the people in this generation did not sit in the house of God and did not go home and read that Bible to their children didn't grab their hands and pray with them didn't worship the Lord didn't give him glory, but they divorced the Lord. 
but they were still using God's name. How dare you divorce the Lord and still walk in their name? There are some folk right now who are in a marriage, but yet they are divorced. They are not faithful. They are not loving. They're sneaking around saying wrong things. They're running around doing wrong things. But God has called his people to be a holy nation, a peculiar people, a chosen generation that God has called forth out of that darkness into the marvelous light. Say, yeah. I want you to understand, child of God, God called divorce treachery. It was never God's intent for man to divorce. It was never God's intent to form a church. And then the church began to break off like branches on a tree. No, a house divided against itself. My Bible said, and Jesus said, it cannot stand. Y'all remember that I told you the way of Satan is always divide and conquer. That's always the move. A leper never changes his spots. He's always trying to call somebody to divide and conquer. Because when you divide in a marriage, what about the children? Their inheritance is cut off. What about the house of God? The anointing is cut off. What about the blessings of God? All of it's cut off. Now you got to hustle any way you can. There are people running from church to church trying to find a way to become of this and become of that. But there will not come an anointing except it come through the head of the household. And if you're not connected to the head, then where will you get your anointing? But I know that the devil, when Saul ignored the way of God and did his own thing, the Bible said there came an anointing, but it didn't come from God. The Bible said a spirit came upon Saul. And he began to prophesy. David recognized and got on that organ, got on that harp, and began to play before the Lord. And the Bible said that evil spirit left. Some folk might need deliverance because when you jump into self-will, you've ignored the value of marriage. You don't understand the value of a covenant that God in that covenant has promised everybody that under divine order, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make a way for you. I'm going to open up a door for you. Can the church say yeah? Y'all remember the word of the Lord. My Bible declares in Psalms 133, it said, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment. He's talking about that anointing. That is upon the leadership. He said it's upon the head. And it ran down upon the beard. Even unto Aaron's beard. Aaron was submitted to Moses. And Moses was his brother. I don't care. You got to understand. God called for everyone to submit. He said it went down to the skirts of the garment. Now you got to understand. That the garment represents a covered body. Anytime there's a garment on the body. That means the body has been covered. And the anointing only runs down on a covered body. Any uncovered body gets no anointing. Any uncovered face gets no anointing. No matter how good your face looks, if there is no beard, if there is no submission like Aaron, there is no anointing. He said, how did it come down? He said, as the dew of ermine. And as the dew that descends upon the mountain, even from the mountain of Zion, he said, there is where the Lord commanded the blessing. In other words, God is saying, there is a divine order. I'm pouring the anointing upon the mountain. It's going to be on the mountaintop. And everybody that lands up, up under that, they will get an anointing. And their children will be anointed. And the blessings will fall upon the household. And they will have no lack. But everybody that gets like a rock and breaks away from the mountain, they will have no anointing and they will struggle everywhere. And they'll find fault in every man. They'll find fault in every woman. And they'll have four, five, six, seven, eight marriages. They'll be in six or seven, eight churches. 
But anybody that's steadfast, unshakable, unmovable, they shall receive the blessing of the Lord. I got to go to my third point. But first, before I want you to understand, the Lord never intended divorce. But the Bible said in Matthew 19, Moses did it because of the hardness of the people's hearts. He said uh, many of them wanted somebody else just because they looked better. Well, you're going to get old too. You're going to get ugly too. You're going to get out of shape too. Age changes everybody. The only thing that keeps you is the anointing of God. Say, yeah. the anointing will preserve you. The Bible said Moses' strength was never abated because Moses was faithful to God. Moses was submitted to God. And it doesn't matter. You got to understand there'll be people of all kinds. There'll be personalities of all kinds. There'll be attitudes of all kinds. And God expects you to be steadfast, to be unshakable, to be unmovable, always abounding in the faith. So no matter what your marriage is about, he wants you to pray for your husband, pray for your wife, but love them through all things. Because love conquers all. Sin. Sin. Yee. I got the clothes. But I want you to understand that God is saying, and this is my last one, turn to tell your neighbor, marriage covers your seed. When one comes into a marriage, they have now become employed by God to reproduce godly seed. And the scripture says, why? Why did he make one? He said the Lord did it because he wants a godly seed. That he might seek a godly seed. He said, but they weren't concerned. <clears throat> His people weren't concerned about what kind of seed. <clears throat> they were living to do whatever they felt like doing. But life is short. <clears throat> you don't have long to live. And if you're living just for the pleasures now, then you're going to go to hell and suffer forever later on. Not only that, your children will have to endure whatever you leave them. Why not leave them the blessing of the Lord? The writer said, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. Oh, there are people who get puffed up and high-minded and they find fault. Some of them did it to Moses. They found fault in Moses. They found fault. They married to Moses. It was God who used Moses to bring them out and set them free. And the anointing had never left Moses. But sometimes they start looking around. They don't come to Bible study. They don't come to prayer. They don't come to worship. And they start looking around, eating ice cream all over the place. And they get fat with the wrong things. Amen. But God wants you to be in the house of God. He wants you to be faithful to your marriage. He wants you to be at home with your family, at home with your husband, at home with your wife. He wants you to be concerned about what God says. Whenever we are running around doing things that we should not do, it is an error that will now pass on through the generations. Generation after generation after generation, there have been families who've been left with nothing. A legacy of witchcraft, a legacy of violence, a legacy of gang activity, a legacy of financial poverty, a legacy of sicknesses. Just everybody in the family got it. The same sickness. Even the doctors in the hospitals now, when they take out a ledger and ask you to fill out a sheet, they want to know your family history. Who had cancer? Well, when you're in the family of God, the Bible said Jesus was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon Jesus, and by his stripes I was healed. And so whatever happened back then, I'm in a new family, in a new bloodline right now. It's all over now. And I'm holding on to this family. How do you know it's the right family? <clears throat> Whenever you see the anointing of God, it means that the power of God. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, he said, no doubt that the kingdom of God has come. You want to see evidence. It's the power of God that gives the evidence. It's not the people because all the people make mistakes. You made some yourself. 
But the Lord was calling Judah and Jerusalem to honor their covenant, to love their God, and to know that there are going to be good days. The sun's going to shine and the moon's going to rise. There'll be hot days and cold days. There'll be seed time, but then there will come a harvest. You determine what your harvest would be. Can you say, yeah? The Bible shows that the only reason that Solomon, or rather his son Rehoboam, had anything left was because of the covenant with his father David. Tell your neighbor, whatever you do today will determine your generations after. Look at somebody say, get right before you get left and value the marriage you made with God. Value the marriage you made with your husband. Value the marriage you made with your wife. And value the marriage you made with your children. God is in this thing. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, and I'm in this thing. I'm in it to win it. Say yeah. Say yeah. Woo. Come on and give God a hand to pray. In closing, the Lord, God, the God of Israel said he hates the putting away. He said they cover with violence their own garments. They cut off their own anointing. That's what he's saying. When he said he covered with their garments with violence, he's talking about they tearing up their own anointing. He said, take heed to your spirit. And I'm saying, check yourself. Don't follow anybody but this Bible and the man Jesus Christ. Follow him. Follow him. When you make a covenant, stick to it. That's why I give marriage counseling to make sure before you do it, you better make sure you're doing the right thing before you do it. But if you give your word, stand by it. If you join into this church in any part of the ministry, stand by it. Be faithful. Don't be a person in pride stuck doing his own thing because God's not with that. There'll be a struggle throughout your life all alone and the blessings that you should have, you'll miss. But if you submit yourself and become faithful to God and trust God, God will make that tree that started from a branch sprout into a big, beautiful family tree. And even in the church, he will sprout this thing bigger than you'd ever seen but he needs unity. Tell your neighbor there's value in a marriage. A marriage is a covenant with God. Honor it all over the building. The spirit of God is yet moving, standing to your feet. Amen. No one looking around, every head bowed. My father, I ask you to search the heart of your people now. And deliver them from their 